Well, I think you might recognize John C. Riley and Steve Coogan, but <laughs> and the unrecognizable gentleman next to me is the director, John S. Baird. <laughs> I recognize him. Yeah. So. I'm going to start with a few questions about the origin and the process of this film. And of course, we will take some audience questions before the evening is over. I guess I want to start at the beginning, the origin of this particular project. I know the script is by Jeff Pope, with whom Steve Coogan co-wrote the screenplay for Philomena. What came first? W were the actors attached first? W were you? How did this come about with the particular group? Um, Jeff, well, my, my agent sent me the script, and, and it was a new agent. I uh, had just finished my previous movie, which was a million miles away. From, filth? You know, yeah, filth. It was a million miles away in tone from this. And he sent me this, and he said, I don't think this is for you. Yeah? That was his oh. <laughs> uh, I said, well, I'll be the judge of that. Yeah. Um, anyway, I read the script, and I, and I, and I cried at the end. And I, and I thought, well, you know, there's, there's not many scripts that make you do that. Uh, so I thought it was incredible potential, and and it was potential at that stage because it, it did change a lot, f you know, fr from that point. But at that point, it was only Jeff and myself. We didn't even have a producer then. It was just a it was just a script that had, that had been written on spec. And then these two beautiful gentlemen uh, joined the, the the project, and I'm sure we'll, we'll talk about how they how they joined. But, but yeah, that was the that was the process of it. Yeah, but they were our first choices, thankfully, and. Uh, uh, it took a little bit of persuading, um, but, um, but yeah, thankfully we, we, we got them, yeah. Okay, well then the likely next question for the actors. I mean, I'll start with you because I think a lot of you know that Steve Coogan's gift for vocal mimicry has been on magnificent display in films like The Trip 2 with Rob Brydon, Trip to Italy, Trip to Spain. He can pretty much nail any impersonation that I've come across. Um, Let's hear a few, Steve. <laughs> yeah, come on, Steve. Okay. <laughs> but, <clears throat> but here, obviously, we're extending into the visual as well as the verbal. Um, what attracted you to this part, or were you intimidated by the notion of playing this iconic character? Uh, both. Both is the, is the answer. Uh, Jeff, uh, I was writing, and I, I, I'm still writing with Jeff, and I was writing something else with him, and he, he was saying, what are you doing at the moment? What else are you working on? He said, I've written this thing about Stan and Ollie. Uh, uh, I, I remember thinking, oh, that's that sounds really interesting. And uh, who, uh, where, where's it at? And and uh, who have you have you thought about who you're going to cast? And I think he meant, he, I think he, he mentioned a couple of names, but he, I wasn't one of them. <laughs> and, um, and then he, uh, and I just kept quiet about it. And then uh, the next, I think after maybe had a conversation with you, he came back and said, oh yeah. Uh, John said, what about, you know, Steve Coogan, uh, and uh, I, I was like, uh, you know, so, so what, what uh, did you, do you think that was, I remember thinking, oh, I'm glad he brought it up so I didn't have to, and it was <laughs> awkward, um, but uh, it, 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 what, what you said is correct, um, it, it was uh, intimidating, uh, but also a, a sort of irresistible as well, um, and uh, so, so, you know, I, I, I met with John, and uh, and um, I think I did a sort of a Stan impersonation. Just a, well, I was just sort of experimenting with. Well, it was it was and it was a very superficial thing that of just the sort of thing I did when I was a kid, which is you know just speaking like that and sort of you know I did all those expressions <laughs> and not being quite. <laughs> <laughs> oh, just that sort of thing, and um, but which is well, but that's <clears throat> but that's but that really is. Um, <coughs> quite a, su su sort of a superficial thing, and there's a danger in that, obviously, in thinking that, that um, oh, I've got this licked. And it's not a long way from that. And uh, But, uh, you know, uh, so I, 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 I circled it a little, and um, uh, but uh, and I, was, I was slightly anxious about about uh, you know, whether it would work or not, and, and whether you know, the script, as, as John said, went through various iterations. Um, but the thing that made me I, 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 want, I so wanted John to, to do it. And I know you sent him. I think I sent him an email saying, please do this, John. 
he probably doesn't remember it, but uh, <laughs> um, but, uh, <laughs> but, but, um, but, uh, but yeah, as soon as soon as John was on board, and John took a long longer, he'll I'm sure explain that. But uh, as soon as I knew he he was going to do it, I, I I I would be very anxious if it hadn't been John and it been someone else. I can understand that. So indeed, for you, the prospect of playing Oliver Hardy. Was this something that you did grasp right away, or you had to be seduced? Well, I, I had to be seduced. Uh, <laughs> so note to any directors in the audience, <laughs> get seducing. No, uh, no, not, not, not so much. <laughs> I always try to talk my way out of jobs these days, because it's a great way of sort of divining what's meant to be and what is you know, something of convenience or whatever. There's different reasons to do things. So to keep the reasons pure, I always try to go like, oh no, not surely not me. Uh, and this, this part in particular uh, was just so, uh, you know, intimidating. And it was, I don't do impressions like like Steve is an expert at it. It's not something I really traffic in. And so that coupled with the fact that I've been in awe of Laurel and Hardy and aware of them. You know, they keep asking us, when did you first become aware of Laurel and Hardy? And I think like, well. I became aware of Laurel and Hardy when I became aware. <laughs> I mean, when did you become aware of salt and pepper? <laughs> like, it's just always there, will always be here. Like, that's that this eternal quality. So, um, so yes, it was very intimidating, and I had to, I had to know, like, as we went along. So the first, actually, I'll say this, I've never said this to an audience before, but since we're in New York, I'll say, I was on Fire Island where I go every year <laughs> with my family, and it's this sort of sacred, special, secret place we go. And, and this guy really wanted to meet me, and it was the summer, and I was like, hey, it's like not a good time. And he's like, they're, they're saying he'll come to you wherever you are. So that means, you know, a car, a train, a ferry, <laughs> a fairly long walk from the ferry to the beach. And there he was. He sat down with me on the porch, and I was like, huh, this guy must really want me to do this. <laughs> Uh, and we talked about it, and then my first concerns were, are we going to really do the makeup and the, and the costume and everything right? Are we going to, you know, independent films don't always have the luxury of doing things the very best way. And I thought, I don't want this to be a legacy. Uh, I don't want it to be a liability for the legacy of Laurel and Hardy. These are people who are so important to me and so formative at every stage in my life in, in terms of my aesthetic sensibility. Like... There was no way I was going to do a disservice to them. So yeah, I slowly, but to make another Fire Island reference, <laughs> I slowly, when, it's the, when the ocean's cold, like, I don't, I'm not one of those people that's like, I'm going in. Like, I like to my, first my feet, and then my calves, like st standing here for 20 minutes with the calves, and then to the knees, like, this next part's going to be very hard. <laughs> All right, so to the waist, to the waist. <laughs> so that's the way I entered into this project. <laughs> was <laughs> like as if the ocean was cold and I had to get used to it and I had to and then you know eventually what what happened is John and Jeff Pope and Steve and all of us engaged about the story and talked about what were going to be the important parts of of this and it wasn't replicating their movies because those exist and it and it wasn't telling anything you can find out in Wikipedia right now on your phone in 10 seconds about their lives it was going to be about something that no one could know except them. So it gave us room to move, and it gave us some artistic license, and it gave us a chance to explore the emotional reality of these guys, which was uncharted territory for these performers anyway in terms of a movie about them. So eventually I just slowly got the courage step by step, but I, I didn't really, you know, I never felt like, boy, we got it today. Like... It was just every day, it was just keep trying, just keep trying. I was sort of praying to Oliver, you know, anytime I get intimidated or nervous or feel like, well, I, I'm not worthy, I would just think, or I was uncomfortable in that makeup or whatever it was, I would just have this meditation of Oliver, Oliver. It's for Oliver, it's for Oliver. So that, for the first time in my life, really, as an actor, gave me this sort of higher mission in, in the playing of a character. It wasn't just to make myself look good or to do a good job as an actor. It was, it was for this man who I really want to honor. You know, that's a, that's a big part of why we made this film, both of us, to honor these guys that didn't quite get their due when they were alive.
it's not just that you do succeed in conveying something of this, this buddy movie, the, the emotional connection that obviously existed, especially, I think all of us were very moved towards the end when Stan gets into bed with Ollie and they're sitting there facing the camera which slowly recedes. But also this is, I realize, an ensemble piece because of the supremely fine casting of the wives. For example, I was saying backstage to John Astaire that Nina Arianda, she is one of the great scene stealers of yeah. contemporary cinema. Yeah, watch, um, your, watch I mean, your pockets when she's in the scene with you. Yeah. I mean, it's, not, it's not just that she nails the, the Russian yeah. accent <coughs> of Ida, <coughs> but it's that, that entitlement of the self-appointed mm -hmm. diva, you know, who every chance she gets to drop the name of Preston Sturgis, because, <laughs> by the way, she really, Ida Kitaeva, the wife of Stan Laurel, really did appear in Preston Sturgis's mm -hmm. film, The Sins of Harold Diddlecock, alongside Harold Lloyd, and she never let anyone forget it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so her, and by the way, Rufus Jones, who plays Bernard Delfont, that's one of the great scene stealers mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. And Shirley Henderson, the baby-voiced British actress who plays Lucille with her oh, oh. voracious devotion. Could you talk a little about the casting and did you have an extensive rehearsal period where these at least five actors got to know the working rhythms of each other? Well, t two things really. The, 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 I'll, I'll come to the rehearsal period with the guys um, second because then they'll probably have something to say about that. But the, the casting out with Steve and John, um, I originally we wanted a, you know an American to play Lucille and somebody of 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 Slavic descent to play to play Ida. Definitely somebody definitely somebody of Slavic descent. That was that was more important than, than having an American for Lucille. But w with Shirley, I had worked with Shirley in the last movie um in in love shirley um but i didn't realize john had 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 worked with her or knew her and uh so we had a few different ideas popping around and uh, and john turned up just as we were you know quite near um um as we were going to pre-production and said oh I, I would you know i would really like you to consider shirley henderson and i said wow I, I didn't even know that you knew who she was you know he said oh well i worked with her before and she's pretty much the best actor, you know, I've, I've, I've worked with, or certainly one of the, the best actors. And I said, well, I'll be delighted. And so, but then we had an up uphill battle with it. Remember, we fought with the producers for, for quite a bit, you know, because, uh, you know, producers like to have somebody of a little bit more, sort of, a uh, little bit more well-known, you know. So Shirley, God bless her, had to come and, uh, she lives in Scotland and, and she had to come down to London and put herself on tape three times. She came down, did it and did it again, did it again. And she was, you know, she was relentless with her enthusiasm for it. Um, but myself and, and John in particular really, really fought for her. Um, and thank goodness, you know, that, 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 you know, that we actually got her because she was just, she, she, you know, she was incredible. And, and the dynamic that they had together, you know, they, they, they shared an apartment in London uh, specifically so they could get to know each other, like John and Steve, you know, got to know each other. Um, and so they had, had this like sisterly. The two actresses shared. Yeah, the yeah, yeah. Or certainly they, they stayed in, 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 on, on, in a hotel with the right rooms next to each other. There was something, they were very, very close anyway, and they hung, hung out with each other all the time. And, but with Nina, I'd always, I'd been working in LA and, 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 and uh, people had always, I had always heard about this name, Nina Arianda, Nina Arianda, you know. And it was, it was not related to the film at all. It was just, her name kept on coming up. And I saw her in Flo Florence Foster Jenkins, and again, she stole the, the, you know, a, lot of the, a lot of the scenes there. Um, and, I, and, and I said, well, look, I'm, I'm, I'm only interested in someone who knows what the Slavic mentality is, you know, because you, you, we talked about this before, you know, there's a, there's a particular type of tough love that these people have got, which is incredible. And, the, and a, yeah, and a, and a humor, <laughs> and an incredible humor that they've got, as dark humor as well. But um, so anyway, her we just found out her parents were from Ukraine, and um, and then it was you know it, it was it all fell into place you know so that that was really the casting but when those girls really elevated what was on what was on the page you know it, there was a, a lot of that stuff a lot of the big laughs that come in a the film they they made that you yeah. know they came to me in rehearsals and uh, said look we've got an idea of how and, and and that's a sign of a great actor when when the part is 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 okay and, and they make it fantastic you know uh, and and they did that and Rufus. I think Steve actually recommended Rufus. You had done something, or your company had done something with Rufus previously, and, yeah. and I was wasn't really aware of him. Again, he read for us, and and 
there was a lot of high profile actors who, who we looked at for, for that part and Rufus, you know, with all due respect, was more of a more of an unknown, but he again in the in, in, in his audition just stole the show and everybody who looked at the tapes was like, Oh, he's our he's our guy. So we were we were very we were very lucky for that. In terms of the rehearsal period, usually in a you know, movie this size, you would have I don't know, maybe you maybe have a week, but we we sacrifice some shooting days to get more rehearsal because it was so important for, particularly for Steve and John, for all those routines that they made look effortless. The, the amount of work that these, that these champions put into that was just incredible. And I'll let them talk about that in a second. Uh, but was three, we had three weeks rehearsal for that. Um, and a lot of the time they would go off and work with a choreographer and I would come in and have a look at it and then go out and, and it would give them time to sort of bond as well as, as, as friends, you know. But, well, you guys more <coughs> add, I mean, add, want to add? <coughs> well, uh, in terms of the rehearsal period, we did, uh, John says, have three weeks, sort of turned into four uh, in the end, but uh, we had three weeks of, uh, ostensibly, John and I just going through the, the dance routines and the, s the sketches, and uh, some of which we sort of devised between ourselves and Toby Sedgwick, the, the sort of clown choreographer guy who gave us advice. To, uh, to Toby famously made the wooden horse, there were the horses in War Horsey. He taught, taught them how to make move like horses. And so he's um, very skilled. And uh, we spent three, three uh, weeks doing that. But what, what it was useful for us was John and I got to know each other better, a lot better. We knew each other a little bit, but we got to know each other very well. We uh, learnt uh, what it was like to be a, like Laurel and Hardy, who themselves would have had to rehearse those sketches and those dance routines. So we were emulating, if you like, what they were doing whilst we were rehearsing. So it, had, it worked in, in, in that respect as well. And, um, uh, and uh, uh, it, it also, we, meant we knew what we were doing. You know, we, we, we learned those things and, and it was quite... What it, the, the revelation to me was the amount of hard, de dedicated work that... Uh, that Lauren Hardy put into the, the work. And the, the, the paradox of good comedy uh, is that the more effortless it looks, the more hard work and more craft has gone into it. And, um, and that, well that, that became quite apparent. Too. Yeah, the, that's the thing about them, that there's so many things about this partnership that make them unique. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about the rehearsal, but it, it, yes, through the process of doing what they did, which is sing, dance, come up with routines and and those routines we we invented those with Toby Sedgwick our clown guy like the hotel clerk thing and the double door routine all of that had to be rehearsed for hours and hours and hours and hours um, but in those moments when we felt like you know do we have anything here are we actually are we making something uh, that's anywhere near what they were making uh, Steve and I just remembered like these guys were plucked out of obscurity and thrown together. They didn't know each other before they started working. And so we had to do what they had to do, which was like look at each other and come up with an act, you know. And even though we, were tr we had the luxury of replicating or at least being inspired by a certain act, um, it was a similar process um, of finding each other and learning to trust each other and um, and rehearsal was a big part of that. I was coming in on the weekends before that three week period began. I was coming in on the weekends while I was making Holmes and Watson and we were doing that way out west dance every weekend. So I was giving, you know, we, uh, it was just, um, that was it a took a long time to get <laughs> that dance. We had to learn, exactly we had to, we right, had to, learn you know? to dance with the mistakes that Lauren Hardy put, the slight errors that they have in their dance. And we had to learn that the, the errors as it were and the mis slight missteps that they did. And then when we and then we did it on stage, so we then had to learn another version of it that without the errors. So that mm. was quite. Easy. Yeah, it was. It was a really, almost like, shamanistic or mystic kind of, <laughs> holy mission we were on because we were constantly evoking these people that weren't just fictional characters. They were people that lived and performed in some of the theaters we were in. Mm. Oh. So we'd be standing backstage like, <coughs> well, they had a conversation right here. You know, like that was this. So the whole time it was this sort of almost haunted feeling. And I'll never forget there was this one moment when we we're doing 
the double door routine for an audience for the first time. And keep in mind, you know, we'd been doing it for weeks and weeks, but for John and different people on the crew who are predisposed to like what we're doing and be charmed by it because they like us and they're hoping for the best for us, you know. <laughs> so some part of you is like, it's like when your parents watch your magic act, like, uh, I, I think it's good. Uh, you know, they like it, but they like me. Um, <laughs> and then we, then we did it in, in front of these groups of people. You know, 400 people would come in, these extras, who all they knew was the title of the movie and what time to show up for work. And they sat down, and we did that double door routine for them. From it, what you see in the film uh, is just a small part of it. There were there were th actually th two more chunks to it. It was this big, long, theatrical piece. Um, and I'll never forget, like looking out and seeing like the faces, like lit up with delight. People were laughing and laughing at this double door routine, especially. Um, and then I thought that was the first moment where I was like, it's working. It's working. These people have no idea who, you know, they didn't, all they're do. they're just laughing at these gags. And yeah. these gags are the gags they used. Yeah. Yeah. We put them in our own order and we made it work for ourselves for the movie. But they do a double door routine in this, in one of their films. It's, a, it's an elevator. It's two different elevator doors. But so anyway, I got backstage and I don't know if you guys remember, I was just like, <sighs> I started to just come apart, you know, I started to cry and and they were like, are you okay? <laughs> it's like, and it was that moment where you think like, it really is eternal. You know, we're passing along, we're holding the torch. You know, I might not be worthy of being Oliver Hardy. No one ever will. No, he's a, these two people were unique human beings. And this partnership was one of the most miraculous partnerships in human history. <laughs> I think, anyway, in terms of partnerships, no one was ever, no one was together that long exclusively uh, and no one made the kind of work that they made. They were way ahead of their time with their acting, too. Anyway, I'm pontificating now and know, going I on and on, but they're very thought-provoking. There's, there's yeah. one thing I just I want to add, uh, add to that, and I, and I hadn't even thought about this, because we've done so many Q&As and, and interviews and stuff. You not only had to, to learn the, uh, the way out West dance as they did it in the film, um, you obviously did it on the stage, but you did it on the stage as older men, yeah. So you, that had to be a bit laboured, and you, I know, John, you had a your fat suit was fatter at that point and, and more weighed down. So you were actually learning two versions of it as well, you know. So anyway, I'm just trying to give you a backhanded compliment today. <laughs> but th that's so important because there are so many layers in this film, layers of performance within the film, layers of what the actual performances were that Laurel and Hardy did, and you've captured, I think, all of them so well. I'm just curious because you're from Scotland. Yeah. Were you watching Laurel and Hardy in your own youth, or when did you become aware? Yeah, of them? They, they were huge. Um, when I was a kid, uh, they used to play the reruns of their films on television uh, after school time, um, and they used to play a lot of Harold Lloyd and and um, and and and, uh, and and Laurel and Hardy. Those were the two I remember watching. But there's a photograph of me as an eight-year-old kid dressed as Stan Laurel at the school fancy dress party <laughs> um, with a friend of mine as, as Oliver Hardy. My mom's mom's my mom still got it. Um, uh, so so the love affair for me went back, you know, way way back then. But I was just you know I was just a fan of the films. I didn't know even until I read the script. You know, I I, I hadn't seen a Laurel and Hardy movie for quite some time. And even until this, I read the script, I had no idea that they even did stage tours, you know. And I thought, well, if I'm a, f I'm, you know, I was a fan since I was a kid. If I, if I didn't know this, this this will be a great story to t to tell, you know, to tell people, you know. And that's why we're saying the untold story, you know, whether that's a good marketing tool or not, I'm not sure. But anyway, it's 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 it, I certainly was a fan from, you know, it was a love affair for me, absolutely. Oh, I I can feel that. Um, I suspect that a lot of what helped you find the characters was the makeup. And I should mention that um, the physical transformation of these two actors was overseen by makeup supervisor Jeremy Woodhead and Mark Coulier, the prosthetics designer who won Academy Awards for the Grand Budapest Hotel and the Iron Lady. Yeah. Um, now, by the 1950s, Oliver Hardy apparently weighed almost 400 pounds. So you had a particularly challenging job sitting in the chair for, for makeup, but also I think for, for Steve Coogan, you know, becoming Stan Laurel and that particular physical, could you talk a little about the role that the makeup played 
in finding the character. <coughs> well, um, his, his story is better than mine. I had a chin and two ears um, uh, uh, that were grafted on every morning. And uh, John and I had to sort of, well, we have the wrong eyes. John has blue eyes, I have brown eyes, and Stan and Ollie was the other way around. So we had to reverse those uh, eyes. <laughs> and, um, uh, and, uh, but, um, and, and I kept my own hair and we dyed it. And, uh, um, but um, th and it's funny because finding the character, that when you, 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 find, you, you use whatever resources you have and you assemble you know, whatever, whatever's out there to help you. And of course, there's all the films. And the films are a manifestation of who they were because they created those characters. So we, working backwards, you know that well, when you play them as Stan and Ollie, which is who we called them in reality, and as opposed to Laurel and Hardy, that there'd be a residue of who they were on screen in themselves when they were in, in their real lives. And um, uh, uh, there was some source material, some archive footage, not a great deal. Um, people used to phone up uh, Stan Laurel when he lived in Santa Monica in his retirement, even after uh, Oliver died. And he was in the phone book, and people would call him up and just chat to him about Laurel and Hardy on the phone. And, and, and some people recorded the conversations, and I was able to get access to those recordings and wow. listen to them and listen to his... his um, is see how he was, of course, because he was the he was a creative force behind it. See how he had a more there was he still he was still recognisably Stan Laurel in, in the tone of his voice, but it was more assertive uh, tone, and um, you know, and uh, so so you, you you have those 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 sort of pieces of the jigsaw, and then you the, and some of the mis pieces are missing, and that's where your creativity comes in, and and but but why why it gives you something to do to be creative to try and use your, uh, uh, make an educated guess in the way you, where you play it. And also why the story is interesting because it's, you, there's no point telling stories that people know. You know. Yeah. It's interesting, the process of finding the makeup and the costume. You know, it's something that you do all the time as an actor, but this was the only time in my, in 30 years of having to s decide what the body of the person looked like, the shape of their body, you know. Usually, I mean, I had a little bit of a belly for the aviator, I remember, but there were these discussions that had to be had about, like, well, this is what he looked like when he was younger, this is what he looked like when he was older. And, and the first prototype for that suit for the older, um, I think you might be exaggerating with the 400, by the way. <laughs> I think it was okay. close to the 325, but <laughs> still a lot. But um, the funny thing about Oliver was that when you, you look at his height and his weight and you're like, okay, if someone was that tall and they weighed this much, put that on a body, that's what it looks like. You know, it, gravity does this to that much weight. And so they built this thing and it had this kind of pendulous belly and it was kind of pulling me down. And, and I was like, guys, there's, not, there's something is a little sad about this and we, we have to take another crack at it. And they were like, well, what, what do you want to do? Like... I, I mean, this is the, what it would probably be like. And um, I was like, no, no, it's got to be something, got to be something. And I was like, w there's no pictures of him naked, obviously. So, <laughs> um, uh, But he had this nickname, Babe. Everyone called him Babe. Uh, everyone who knew him called him Babe. Because from the time he was a baby, he looked like a fat little baby. <laughs> you know, all his whole life, you know, it, the way that his weight was packed on him, was up high and like like a like a toddler, like a chubby toddler, like in the arms and in the legs, and and he carried himself w like almost by a string from the center of his chest, you know, like he was always working against that weight, and 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 so I, I started thinking about like okay, fat baby, fat baby, <laughs> and I started looking up Google images of fat baby in case if the NSA is wondering why I did that, <laughs> <laughs> it's for that reason, okay. <laughs> and so I, st I mean, <coughs> most of them had diapers, I think. Anyway, uh, I start, I'm sending fat baby pictures to the to the prosthetics and uh, fat two people, and and it was like, ding, that yeah. that was it. And yeah. suddenly, boom! I put it on. I was like, there we go. Yep. That's the way. So then we established the body, and now you have to build all the clothes on top of that. Like the costume designer was flipping out because he can't do anything until they just what he knows what those dimensions are. Um, and then there's this whole process with Marc Coulier, who's a, who is a master. I mean, it's like working with Caravaggio or something. It's like you can't believe the talent. It's just channeled into this very specific art craft. Uh, but 
he does all that. Steve and I look at each other and we think like, all right, well, we look like the guys now. And in a way, our interactions with that stuff is over. Um, we look at it every day in the mirror as they're putting it on or whatever, but it's this thing that other pe people have built on us. Um, and then the real challenge, like once that just gives you the confidence to explore the person. You know, you're like, okay, well, now I look like him. I better figure out who this person is. And it, like Steve said, there's a lot of that reverse engineering where you're looking at the very few behind the scenes kind of things that you have, books written about them, et cetera, letters, um, but also um, you're looking at their on-screen personas because like Steve said, they were, all, they, were, they were the authors of these people, you know? They yeah. weren't written for them. Yeah. It had to come from somewhere and it came from them, we, we hypothesize. You know? I, I, I would say it's, a little like, it's not like method acting really because you're sort of starting out with, with the external and then go working backwards sort of, sort of like you, uh, uh, that, uh, and sort of building it from the outside in in a strange way. But, um, it, 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 which is which is always can, can be fraught with problems, but you, but there's a, there's a strange way of finding authenticity from from all those external things and, well, and, and developing something that isn't that goes beyond being superficial. You know. But I mean, once you really investigate thoroughly in a forensic way, like both of us did, what someone looks like, it really starts to bring you into what they felt like or what it felt like to be that person, especially Oliver. You know, I would go sit out on the stoop outside sometimes to cool off in a t-shirt or whatever with that. You couldn't tell it was a fat suit, <coughs> it was just the makeup. You could be this close to me and it looks real. Yeah. Um, people would walk by and, and I had this hard, a couple hard, real heartbreaking moments where, you know, I'm sitting there in this stoop, just kind of cool off. They don't know it's John Riley. They don't know it's Oliver Hardy, most people walking by. Why would they? And they... And remember, like, a sort of attractive woman walking by and kind of looking down at me and like, oh, look at this giant man. And then sort of, <laughs> oh, but I shouldn't look. I, shouldn't I, was, look. I was there. I that want day. him to disappear. Like, I, I was there. And there was this, uh, yeah. I was there that day. Do you remember when I was? Yeah, and you laughed was, at me because I, of it. I, was, I start, started walking past him saying, did they look at you like this? And, yeah. And just do a slight look sideways and go, like a, a yeah. smile of sympathy. <laughs> Of what I was like, exactly. Sweaty man. It just and happened I'm not to going me. Anywhere near him. Yeah, yeah. You're right, Steve. You are the one that pointed that out to me. <laughs> but once it hit home, <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Once it hit home, then you realize like it really takes you to a place of uh -huh. empathy for that person because I could take this suit off and that makeup came off every day, but that guy had to live with that body at a time in the 1930s when there weren't very many big people around. He was a real oddity at that time, and he, he struggled with it. There were moments where he tried to lose weight, and the studio was like, ah, 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 you know, let's not mess with the formula there, babe, you know? Um, so it was, it was an interesting thing. It gave me a lot of empathy for the guy. But really, all that stuff, what, you know, all the makeup and all that is, is the amazing art, art of other people. And then the thing that Steve and I had to do was go inside. And what I, what I discovered at the heart of Oliver Hardy was a romantic. You know, someone that wine, women, and song. Mm. You know, this guy, it's Steve, what, what was the line that you said about well, the, the, their the, philosophies? The, the, that Oliver uh, wor uh, lived to, no, worked to live, and Stan lived to work. Yeah, so the, Oliver took the, the fruits of his work and used it to enjoy the fruits of Hollywood, you know, go on boats and go down to Tijuana and go to the horse track, you know, um, that, that really, he's a, he was a, a really rich personality to, to investigate. He's a beautiful, beautiful, kind-hearted, big-hearted guy. Yeah. I also want to acknowledge that what makes this film work so well is not only the extraordinary performances and the richness of the story. It's visually so interesting to me. My students from Columbia who are in the audience know how much emphasis I put on opening scenes. Um, I always consider that in a great motion picture, the first two, three minutes tell you how to watch the film. And I was extremely aware when watching this for the first time a few weeks ago that it begins with the, the shot of the two hats, yeah. uh, already evocative. And then as the camera slowly recedes, you have both men sitting in front of a mirror mm -hmm. so that you have right away the reflection of each, you know, a kind of questioning of the doubling of these people. Mm -hmm. And then you pull quite a number on us. 
I don't know if you noticed this, but the camera keeps receding, follows the two men out into the bright sunlight of the studio, and then proceeds to follow them in an unbroken, inter uninterrupted take into the actual studio where they meet up with Hal Roach. Mm. That was like a six minute long take, I think. So I, I just wanna ask, because I think you should all realize it's so much harder to do that kind of a fluid motion than to break it up into you know, at least 12 different shots. Why you did that? Okay, there's a few reasons. Uh, first of all, that w when the script came through, the first script came through, it was nine pages of dialogue set in the dressing room. Um, and so first of all, the first piece of thinking was, right, we need to get this on, you know, on its feet. Um, so it slowly sort of built from there, the idea from there. But then we also thought, you know, in terms of reflecting where they were in their, life, in their in lives and their career at that point, this, you know, very ostentatious, elaborate sort of set, we were trying to, 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 to show how they were, on, you know, they really were on top of the world, you know, and things, everything was just going for them at that point. And you'll notice, you know, 16 years later, the, the photography is, is, is becomes very simple a lot of the time after that, until we get, really until we get back on stage with them at the end, and we, and, and we show sort of flourishes of, um, you know, of, 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 their, of their youth, really, you know, but the, the, the opening shot was actually broken down, uh, it is about six minutes, you're right, but it was broken down into three locations, yeah? So they were, when, they, when, they, when they go from the dressing room through to, um, through to the outside, yeah? There's actually a join there, yeah? So when they go into the sunlight, there's a, there's a, there's a visual effect. Hopefully you don't notice it, but th th that's, th there is an effect. I could have really said, yeah, it was on a one or the whole thing was on a one or, yeah. But, some, but these guys would have, <laughs> pointed, no, John would have pointed it out. Uh, but anyway. But the middle um, section's like three minutes. Yeah, yeah. But, the, the, but, but the main section, <coughs> the, the main section is when they go outside, when they track right through, when there's about 150, 200 extras there, uh, and they go right through into, into this, the stage and stuff. That's all in one, yeah. Um, and I was, uh, I was very, fortunate uh, two or three years ago to work with Martin Scorsese on, on vinyl and really got close to him and for whatever reason he, he kind of took me under his wing and has mentored me quite a lot since that point. He's, he's actually hosting a screen for us in, in, in New York tomorrow night. Um, but he, he gave me a lot of advice on, on how to execute that shot, obviously being the master and has been ripped off so many times at, 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 at that thing. But So I was very lucky with that. But, um, the, 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 a fun fact uh, about that whole uh, sequence was the outside bit. We shot that in Pinewood Studios in London, where, where our production offices were. Um, and we had one day to shoot it because Star Wars had all the stages, yeah? <laughs> Star Wars basically had every single stage and they had one day off and it was a Sunday. It was Sunday the, I think it was Sunday the 17th of April or something like that. And that was your day. Get in there, dress overnight, <laughs> Do the thing, and you have to you have to pull it off in one day. Not only that, you have to pray that it's going to be sunny because we had to. It was London. It was London, London? in April, um, and it had to look like Culver City. Um, and the day before was torrential rain, and the day after was torrential rain, and then on the day we shot it, it was beautiful sunshine. You know, so um, and we did we did uh, we did 18 takes of that shot, and we used the 18th one. Um, and, and I have to say, because I know they're going to point this out if I don't say it, <laughs> it, was, <laughs> it wasn't because of dialogue, it was because of te you know, technical stuff and that. But That's it was the, right. And it was, the, it, was the, <laughs> it was the 18th shot. But one last thing I want to well, yeah, I went add. So if you'll notice, you know, as you go through that shot, the ba if you're looking, there's so much going on anyway, but in the background, like, there's, <clears> there's a couple of, it would have been 1937, there's a couple of um, Roman soldiers playing baseball. And then there's some Egyptians walking past, drinking coffee and smoking. Yeah, and the idea that I, the, the, the idea I got from that was actually from being in the back lot with Star Wars and seeing stormtroopers walking past on their iPhones. Yeah, <laughs> and just you know, just bizarre things like that every day. You know, and uh, and and that was how we sort of built that in. But 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 yeah, we had a lot of fun doing that. And um, but really, it was to, to open big. You know, you want to open big and and and, and show how how exciting the world was at that point, and then boom. But it's not just that. I mean, I, I don't even think it's ostentatious, to, to quote your word. Okay. When I see a shot like that opening a film, I know I have to pay attention. 
Mm. I know that the filmmaker is showing me that it's not gonna be chop chop, you know, my usual absorptive seeing montage. I have to go with the flow and I have to notice detail. That's what you made me yep. do. Mm. I have to notice where is the camera going now? What's in the background? And I sort of get a sense of not only the world of 1937 that you're representing, but you as a filmmaker mm. navigating the space in unity of time and giving your actors a chance to move in a way that you will follow them. Mm -hmm. that, that's what I felt anyway. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 it's all, it was all about these, these, these characters, you know, and uh, we, you know, it, we, we had to design it throughout. But another thing that we did, and this is, I know there's a lot of film students out there and, and m maybe of interest to you is, um, because we didn't have the access to the actual location, we built the whole thing as a miniature in the production office and we would, we built the miniatures of Laurel and Hardy and of the extras and of the vehicles and everything that you see on screen, we, we had it built because we had, as I said, we had one day to shoot and we, pr we planned that to the last degree, you know. We, okay, at this point we're moving around here and there's a car crosses and then there's three girls run past and, and that was all, it had to be, re with a, you know, with the AD department, with every department, mm -hmm. it was like a war room, you know, <laughs> it really was and that's how, that's how we, we, we managed to achieve it. In one day. So and anyway. we didn't drop a line, did we, John? No. Yeah, we I maybe did. did, did I did mention that, Steve. Did we yeah. me I just wanted to mention it again. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> bye. <laughs> <laughs> and if you yeah. added up, I, I forgot what the figure was, but it was something like 27 kilometers, like the amount of that we walked, because we had to go back and forth and back and forth and back. And, Maybe not 27. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't even know what a kilometer is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not 27, yeah. But, uh, you can relate. Come on. Was, now, you mentioned the mentoring of Scorsese, and you actually worked with Scorsese, Gangs of New York, and The Aviator, if I'm not mistaken. Now, for, for some of us here who remember um, Goodfellas pretty well, there's an actual shot in the Copacabana where the camera for many, many minutes follows the action going through the kitchen er and around. But I wanted to ask you whether you could sense in or compare with the way that John Baird directed you with let's say Scorsese, or both of you have yeah. worked with so many. All right, John, goodness, please go. don't. No, and, but I mean that. Just like Martin Scorsese. Just like Martin Scorsese. There you go. Yeah, yeah, there you go. There are inspirations <laughs> that come to directors and to actors yeah. from the greats that have preceded. So I'm just curious about how. how well, you it's interesting. An actor's life is a really interesting one in that way. You, you're like, a, you're like a, a double agent. You know, <coughs> like. I've worked with Terrence Malick, I've worked with Martin Scorsese, I've worked with Robert Altman, Paul Thomas Anderson. None of those guys know what the sets of each other are like. No, Scorsese's not there watching Paul Anderson direct, you know, but I have. So when I work with him, like, oh, this guy's like this and this guy's like that. And I, I, I do think of the actor's job as sort of a loyal soldier position. Like, Film is not an actor's medium, it's a director's medium, so you're there to adapt yourself to what they need. They're the ones that have been b playing with like miniatures of that scene <laughs> for four weeks. Yeah. You're just showing up, like, all right, where do we go, John? Where are we walking, yeah. you know, like. Yeah. So, <clears throat> but there are certain, there are certain, th th there are certain qualities that all the great directors have had. Unfortunately, John has none of them. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, what, what John Baird and Martin Scorsese and Paul Anderson and Robert Altman and Terrence Malick, all those people I just mentioned, all the best directors I've worked with are enthusiastic, number one, and this movie would not have happened without the enthusiasm of John Baird. Mm -hmm. Now, not only the skill and the artistry, but the enthusiasm, yeah. 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 When, I, when I thought I couldn't do it, you know, he, he, he thought I could do it. You know, every step of the way, you've got to have someone who's like, no, no, come on, come on, come on. So um, you need someone who's enthusiastic, and you need someone who's paying attention and who loves actors but doesn't feel like they know exactly how actors are doing what they're doing. You know, like some directors, they... They want to talk too much, you know. Yeah. They get in there and kind of. Yeah. I'm just like, hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just <laughs> let me do my job, you know. Like, tell me what you want. And I'll get there, but don't tell me how to get there. Like, yeah. Yeah. Um, so John is John is 
is very much like Martin Scorsese in that way. He's fascinated by actors. He, he, he trusts us. He encourages us. He's enthusiastic. He pays attention to every single little thing that changes from take to take. Because on a film set, you know, here it is. We're, we're working months and months and months to get to this moment between action and cut. This sacred time, this holy time, this suspension of time. And sometimes no one's watching what the actors are doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, so you need someone who you know every single take. If you if you muffled a word, or if you yeah. changed something, or you tried a new tack, or you, you tried something that was different that you thought was working better, you need someone afterwards affirming it, going like, "Yeah, I saw that. Don't do that again." <laughs> or, <laughs> actually, they never do that. Scorsese is a, a brilliant. Brilliant diplomat in that way, and I think it's it's a classical Italian quality, actually, this courtly way of talking, where you engage with people and you start to get into a conversation with them. You express your thoughts and and your feelings about things, but Mar Marty never says no, or he never says you shouldn't have, or he never says you know. You just you listen to him like uh huh uh huh. And it's like blah, 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 blah. it was. You know, like the references, black narcissus, and you know, like, okay, okay. Um, but and then he walks away, and you're like, oh, I shouldn't do that thing. When I, <laughs> but he's never said it. You know, you just go, oh, I see what he wants. And, and <coughs> in order to do that, I should do this. You know, like, I, anyway. But yeah, John, mm -hmm. John, you know, look at. I mean, the movie speaks for itself. It's one of the best movies I think I've ever done. So and yeah, John directed yeah, it. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I, my experience uh, of John was uh, that when I was, it, it, and it's something I like because I don't like those directors who talk, go and say, "What do you think you had for breakfast this morning?" As the character, like, I don't fucking know. <laughs> <laughs> or I know I don't if I'm, you know, I didn't wear 1930s underpants. You know, I wear my Calvin Klein's because they're comfortable. <laughs> I don't give a shit about that. Like, but anyway. You have to be angry about it. I know what well, I do. Okay. <laughs> so, but the, but the thing is, <clears throat> um, John uh, uh, John would uh, tell tell me to make something more, more. Would have a few words and come and say, make it more Stan, uh, more more uh, Laurel or more Stanley uh, to show which was because Laurel was going towards the the more performed character and Stanley was more grounded. But sometimes he'd say dial it up or dial it down, and. Um, and sometimes when I was when the uh, he would the voice would say just you know he'd just say a few words about doing that and then if something was good be very enthusiastic and never there was never any negativity from him um, in terms of uh, saying or or if he had any anxieties he never passed them on <laughs> so uh, yeah thanks for that. Uh, we we are going to take some audience questions in a moment but before we do. Um, I've always been fascinated by the fact that both of you um, have excelled and been very prolific, not only in characters where your body is visible, but doing the voiceover for a lot of animated films. Um, you know, it, it's not just the Holmes and Watson that is going to be released <coughs> later this month, in which um, John C. Riley co-stars with Will Ferrell playing Holmes to his Watson, but the film that broke box office records a week ago or two weeks ago was Ralph Rex the Internet. Um, Ralph Breaks. I'm sorry. Uh, obviously. Should be Rex the Internet. No, Ralph Breaks, breaks the, the Internet, Wreck It Ralph 2, right? Right. Is that the full? I wrote it down to make sure. I didn't see it because, unfortunately, I'm trying to see every. Si <laughs> 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 I'll go tomorrow. Tomorrow. Come back. <laughs> All right. Bye. Tomorrow. <laughs> <coughs> And Steve Coogan <laughs> has been doing the Despicable Me films um, and has soon the Adventures of Drunky, where you play the devil, and Sam Rockwell and Nina Arianda co-star. Um, do you, I'm just curious, do you find as much satisfaction, gratification professionally from doing these voiceovers as from the incarnated roles? Well, it's a whole different art form in a way. And it's exactly the same as everything else you do. You know, you cross into the looking glass, you try to put yourself in the position of a character. And then when you're doing an animated movie, you don't have the luxury of expressing yourself with your body, even though I still do. I almost, 
I have this other way of expressing myself that's even more emphatic with my body in order to kind of send it in t as just an audio signal, you know? Um, and they film us when we do it, so they, they do use the expressions that we make as a kind of roadmap for what they're gonna how they're gonna animate the person. But um, I really love it, actually. It reminds me of, well, first of all, you're never fighting the sun. It doesn't matter when the sun's going down. You know, like on live action movies, that's like this obsession. <laughs> uh, it doesn't matter what you wear. No one touches your face or you don't have to change your clothes, you know. Um, and, and, and you're never pressed for time. You can just do it, do it again, try something different, try another word. Did, I, that, did you think that was funny? All right, do another one of those. And you're, so you just, it's like this creative laboratory. You're just in there goofing around for four hours, yeah. and you're always weeks ahead of the animators. So it's this luxurious kind of play, you know? Um, and then, uh, yeah, so I, it reminds me of sitting down for like the first reading of a play when you're doing theater or, or whatever. You're just sitting there. You know, you're not obligated to act it all out, you know, just reading it. And, but you want to send all the energy that it needs to reflect what's in the script. Um, or like a radio player or something. I, I really love it, I have to say. And the, and the money ain't bad. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> well, I, I, uh, I, years ago, <coughs> pardon me, <coughs> I started out doing a show called Spitting Image in the UK, which is uh, lots of famous politicians and celebrities and... I would show up every week, and we'd do the, all the voices, and and uh, and I did lots of I did I used to subsidize my comedy when I was experimenting in the early days by doing loads of voiceovers, um, but I hated it. I hated doing it. I, did, I, I was the you know I was I was the guy who reads the disclaimer really quickly. Uh, <laughs> really? Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, it's amazing. Did, yeah, yeah. Quite, you had, don't add, add, don't add volume. If you add volume, it adds length. Okay. So, <clears throat> but I did, I did a bunch of that stuff. <laughs> I, <laughs> <I'm writing it laughs> um, but um, I, I, I did a lot of those, th those things. And, uh, uh, the, the, uh, and of course, I did, we were doing comedy with the, the, with the puppet show and then going on to do some of these big features. Um, that, then that's a different thing because you're doing it, it's more, more of a creative thing. You always feel slightly unclean when you're doing a, a, an ad. I do, I did. But, um, mm -hmm. but, um, uh, but when, when you do the, these animated films, then you can create, and I really love the idea of creating a voice, and especially when they go, here's the artwork, this is what we think it's going to look like, maybe a bit like this, maybe a bit more like this, what voices can you do that will so suit this character? And um, as I remember, there's a, a one character I did in Despicable Me is called Silas Ramsbottom, one of the, one of the voices I do. And... Um, I remember when they drew him, I said, how fat do you want his larynx? Because you can do a fat larynx, uh, which is when some, because when someone speaks like this, if, they, if they've gained weight, they, they, their larynx starts to sound slightly fatter. And the, and the more weight they gain, the faster it will sound. So eventually, <laughs> oh my they, God. They, speak, you hear, they almost can't speak because they're so fat. <laughs> you see, so you sort of fatten the larynx as you go. Right? And, and, and I say, just tell me how fat you want him to be because you, anyway, so and I like those technical. Most Q and A's don't get that, by the way. <coughs> <laughs> Pretty cool that just happened. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we have time for just two or three questions. If we can raise the lights slightly, I'll repeat. If I can get a quickie, there's one down here. Yes. First, thank you for making me feel like a child again. What did you do to get to the essence of their relationship, um, whether it was research uh, or the processor? Uh, well, I, I mean, I'll, I'll have a go at that. Um, I mean, it's, 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 it's guesswork based on the information you have and the script and, and the, the, the direction and the tone. But to, 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 I think we, you know, you go on a little journey. And when we arrive, well, there's very emotional scenes where we cut to the, the sort of the crux of what, what, uh, well, there's a very emotional scene at the party where there's this conversation and there's a scene in the bedroom and I, I remember there's a scene where I'm John tells me sorry John Oliver tells me he's um, uh, leaving uh, doesn't he's, he's retiring that just f having done the work so far you, you sort of you arrive at this place where you feel like you can't say I know what he's like but you you just give it your best shot and think I 
I think, having done all this rehearsal with John, I've, I'm already there. I'm already there. I'm in this sort of. Uh, it's like life is condensed. You know, they they did it for 30 years. We did it for three months, but you you, you arrive at a place where it feels authentic. I, I, you know, that felt when he told me he was retiring. It felt you know, even thinking about it now, I can I can feel myself starting to get a bit choked up, feeling that, that this this partner I'm working with is is no longer going to work with me. It's, it, it, it's, it's, uh, it's, this is how part of it is. This is how I would feel if, you know, uh, and uh, how I imagine stuff. We'll figure out something. <laughs> Man, we'll figure out something. Else. <laughs> <coughs> but so, um, it, it, yeah, you just you try and create the conditions, and it just feels it feels real and authentic. And the conditions that were the makeup or the, the director, John, or or the writing, all this stuff is just. Uh, all, uh, an environment to try and make it as authentic as possible. And if that happens, then it just sort of, um, it, you know, it sort of, it happens. There were some things about Laurel and <coughs> or Steve and I that were a stretch, you know, different aspects of their personalities or certain skills that they had or whatever. But Steve and I have been performers our whole life. You know, one of the beautiful things about doing this movie was getting to be in all these backstages. That's where I'm like, ah. <laughs> My natural habitat. Uh, so um, as, <coughs> as different as we are in, s in certain respects with these men, we also have been performers our whole lives. We've been in duos before. You know, I've been locked in intense. Every time I come to New York, I think about doing True West with Phil Hoffman here. It was such an important moment for me. And that was a duo. That, yeah, it was one of the first intense duos that I ever had to invest in in that way. So I know what it feels like when something goes screwy on stage and someone hurts your feelings or, or you know, or you have a great night, a triumph, you know, and you can hug each other backstage. Steve also has done tons of work like that. And so we understand, I mean, one guy falls ill, that's a fact. The other guy has to decide what to do. That's a fact. We didn't make up those facts about them. And so we had to find out, like, well, what would it feel like? What would it feel like? And, it, and if it's anything like what we would feel like in that situation, well, then, yeah, that's, then, then we have that in common with these guys. So it's, it's funny. Chemistry is one of these things people talk about, like, it's this mysterious rain that falls on certain people. Chemistry. I met her, and I knew we had chemistry. Uh, and it can't, you can't have it. You know, it just has to be there. But in fact, you can earn it with each other. And Steve and I earned it the way that Laurel and Hardy earned it with each other, by trusting each other, learning who the person was, being there for them, picking them up when they're down, and vice versa. And, um, and that's how you build chemistry. One day, presto changeo, when you've been standing shoulder to shoulder with someone long enough, whether it's Phil Hoffman or Steve Coogan or whoever, Will Ferrell, if you really open your heart to them and you're willing to sometimes be the beta person in the relationship, right? Because it's, you know, a lot of guys, they only know how to be the alpha, you know? Mm -hmm. And so when you work with people like that, you're like, okay, you want to do that. Okay, well, we, <laughs> but Steve and I and all of my great partnerships, like Phil and those people, like, you, tr you take turns, like, yeah. oh, you take yeah. the lead. Yeah. Oh, I don't know what to do here. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I, I got it. Here, follow me, follow me. Like, and it's yeah. like that, and, and that's how chemistry is born. Anyway. Yeah. Thank you. That, that's yeah. a very illuminating answer. <laughs> Gentlemen, right here. Yeah, right here. The question is about, there are hundreds of letters written by Stan Laurel to fans Did you for years. That's right. Did you ever go beyond the script to those letters? Yes. I, <coughs> I, I, read, I read like a book full of those letters. Um, uh, and he was very fastidious in, and conscientious. In his retirement, he, had, he didn't do anything else. He spent all day typing letters in response to every, he answered every single letter that was written to him personally. And typed it out on time, and they, 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 they exist. Don't you do that? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> uh, yeah. So uh, uh, and uh, yeah, we, we read those, and he's he's still engaged in, um, in 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 those letters. He's still engaged in his 
person. When I said before, he lived to, to work. That's true. His work defined him. And, there's, and, that's, and that's, that's the case with a lot of creative uh, geniuses, that they devote themselves to their work so much that it damages them as human beings, almost. And, and that's, that, that, that uh, is a, sort of a, a perennial problem uh, that they have. And it was the same, same for Stanley. And you could see that in the letters, because he would sit and talk about, uh, and, and even the phone calls sometimes. People would say, oh, Stanley, remember um, this episode, where this, this, this um, uh, short, where, where you, know, you did this and did that, and, and that he would know exactly what they were talking about. And when they asked a specific question, he would remember and say, oh, yes, I remember this. You know, he, he, because he was so tuned into this stuff that he had done 20 years ago, any questions people had, he was very specific in his process and remembered why something was arrived at, why this creative decision was arrived at, because he was obsessive. Uh, before we, uh, I want to get <coughs> this out before the night ends. We, when you go home tonight, watch a Laurel and Hardy yeah. short. I watched one on the airplane on the way here. I watched a series of them, and I was laughing out loud. There's this one called Helpmates that's so amazing. <laughs> Oliver throws a party, and the house is a mess, and he makes the mistake of asking Stan to help him clean up before his wife gets <laughs> home. It's yeah, yeah. amazing. And even after all this talking about it, and talking about how I still love Laurel and Hardy, I, I started to watch it on the plane just now, and I thought, well, you know, you've been saying how they still make you laugh, but don't feel obliged, you know, just watch it. And I'm just sitting there by myself, like, bah! Bah! like completely losing it. Like, there's, it still works. So treat yourself tonight and watch 20 minutes of them. Actually, yeah. and not just that, um, my husband, who knows TV much better than I do, found on YouTube this is your life from mm. 1954. Well, if you want to slit your wrists, watch that one. Well, but no, no, but actually, <laughs> it's pretty sad. It's yeah. sad, but I, I was so moved I, I, watching the real Laurel and Hardy, yeah. the real wives. Yeah, it's incredible. It's like seeing Superman and Batman together. Like what? How can they, in the real world like? But the sad thing about that, this is your life episode, is the way that they got them there. They said that we got this movie project that they're interested in you for, and when it was revealed, as nice as it was, uh, yeah, you can see Oliver's yeah. like. I know. Are you yeah, fucking kidding me? Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> I know. Yeah. But it, it, it's a fascinating PS. Yeah, anyway. Sorry. After seeing a movie like this and watching yeah, it, some it's of the yeah, yeah, it, yeah. it is worth watching, so it definitely it's is. It's definitely this yeah. time period. Yeah, that show is right watch. around this time period. Yeah. Um, I have a lot more questions. I know some of you do too, but I will leave you just with uh, two things. One is that this film will be released on December 28th by Sony Pictures Classics. Please tell your friends if you appreciate it because it'll be in theaters. And I also, a quick word of congratulations. I mentioned it earlier that John C. Riley received a, a Golden Globe nomination for Best Actor in a Comedy or Drama. That's, yeah. Well, thanks. And, uh, thanks. I just want to tell you how much we appreciate that the actors <coughs> and the director joined us for this really illuminating discussion. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thanks a lot, you guys. <laughs> <coughs> Thank you all.